C part. It's kind of um, widely known, however, it's, it's mainly C subject matter, uh, but the collection comprises um, paintings, photographs, jewellery, arms and armour, ephemera. Um, and it's, I suppose, when you start to collect, you, kind of, you have, a, have a particular focus, and that's kind of why I'm just going to go over time, just because things overlap, and, uh, uh, and you need, you know, you can't just be collecting, when you're, when you're bringing about a collection, for example, on the history of Sikhs, and go over the Sikh artistic traditions, you very quickly start to bring in other elements that you didn't think that you initially were going to set up. Yeah, because, yeah, I always had you down in the early days, kind of the, someone who had his sword to daggers, because that's kind of the thing, right, you know. Um, and then suddenly you start collecting paintings, which is like, not very manly, I thought, you know. You know it was, there were paintings and the jewellery as well, a whole, whole raft of things. But I guess, I guess it's, yeah. it's two questions, what, what's, what's coming out of that? Because to, to me, you're not kind of a specialist, are you? What's that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think at the beginning it's um, you know, let's, let's go back to the beginning actually, mm -hmm. how it actually starts. You know. um, when it started, I think subconsciously I think I was just trying to kind of find a bit of an identity uh, and kind of you know, just, just find my sort of place. And and with that, you know, hopefully just become a bit comfortable within myself and I think subconsciously I was looking for things that would help me to understand myself better here and now um, and that's become more conscious over time and beginning you, know, you have an interest um, in history and in philosophy and, and in art generally interested in art and that kind of came about together came together when I went when I was volunteering at VA back in 1999 where all of those things coincided. And all of those things coincided, they coincided in, in, in the form of objects and material heritage. And that was, that was transformative. It was very, very powerful for me, for me to, to, to go to the museum, to see something that I could kind of physically be connected to that was proof of um, what I might have been reading about in books or the land that I've been visiting, you know, periodically with my family. And, and, um, and the next revelation from that was actually to find out that these objects don't just exist behind museum glass, but you could still find some of these objects. You could, you know, that was one problem for me. So, you know, I, I didn't go out going to these museums in the first place. So first of all, to find out that I was always sitting here on my doorstep anyway, and it was free to go and see it. And then the second you know, revelation was, well, actually, if I go down to Portugal Road on Saturday morning, or this antique fair or that antique shop, I still actually might be able to find something, and not just find anything, you could find something that was better or more scarce and more rare than was in the museum. And when that, when I started to kind of initially kind of grab and collect anything that I could find with the money that I had, which was very little, because you think it's, it's the only one or you think that's it's going to vanish, and, um, and then you slowly, slowly start to bring these objects together, and then they start to tell a story. Then this story and this narrative develops. So I, you know, so I, you know, there's two different types of, there's kind of two um, ways of looking at when people are a museum goer. If you're a connoisseur, kind of museum goer and collector, then you might want to see things in a museum ordered by type. Okay, I want to see all the ceramics ordered by type in region order, in date order, and whatever else. And what they find increasingly um, more engaging is actually how do we tell a story through those objects? Let me see a ceramic, but then let me see an earring, and let me see a textile, let me see a photograph. How do we use that? How do we, they are obviously objects, but how do you bring them to life? How do you give them meaning now so that I can apply that meaning? And as like I say, much of that was subconscious for me when I was first doing it. Yeah, and I think, I think you hit the nail on the head for me when I look at the collection through the book, is that you collect to tell this narrative about, about the Sikhs uh, as a uh, people, as a religion, and there's also a wider context to that, we'll, we'll perhaps touch on that as well, so I think that rings true for me as an observer as well. Let's dive into an object or two. Um, and you know, so we can all probably appreciate what, what you have, like what is it, you know. Um, give us an example of an object that you found uh, that really 
does tell that narrative that you thought, you know, that this really starts to explain or give me, give everybody something to talk about, that explains the story, the wider story? Um, so it's something that really comes to mind, and it's, um, is in the London Auction House, I think it was about 2010, um, came across this, this Indian miniature, this Baha'i miniature painting, and it was described, I think, as uh, a meeting of, of yogis. Um, but I, because I was a little bit familiar um, with the subject matter and various books, I immediately recognised, sadly, this is, I don't think this is one of the most famous yeah. images, but we can talk about that uh, in a moment later. But, um, I really recognise Guru Nanak. I really recognise him in, in the centre of this uh, image, uh, you know, the founder of the Sikh state. And, and most people wouldn't have recognised him in that image because he was young and he had a black beard and he, didn't, he wasn't wearing a turban. He was, he was wearing a, a, a Sufi hat and he had um, a Hindu thread around his waist and his forehead was marked with filler. Thing, image, an image of him that you wouldn't ordinarily see in any Sikh home or any Sikh temple. So it went by. You know, it, people didn't detect it being him. Sadly, there was one other person that didn't detect it. So we had a bit of a in the auction room. But that, I think, was a wonderful, was a wonderful example of the type of thing which is, type of art that we um, painting which is quite obscure. It has lots of, it's packed with meaning. And, uh, and that meaning was you know, to be sort of uh, uncovered and un And I think, if, if, I'm, if I read correctly, that's the Guna with the gun Fakhi Yogis, is that what That's right. right. So, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's an image yeah. that's related to, uh, it's probably from a German Saki manuscript, a manuscript that would um, you know, detail stories from his life, life stories. And that was a particular um, story about when Guru Nanak um, at Tachal Vadala went to meet the Sids went to meet these great yogis in his early years. He has his companion with him, and he's uh, and, it, and it runs parallel to um, the Sid Bors, which is in the Guru Granth Sahib, which talks, which details the conversation that he had with those yogis, yeah. questions that they asked him. They were highly revered uh, Ganfak yogis, split eared yogis. Yeah. You can identify them because they have these earrings and ears, and um, and he had to justify who he was. He had to talk about where he came from, what his mission was, what did he believe. And uh, it was a crucial part of his journey. But just to, but then to find that in 2010, in an auction house in London, not being correctly identified, it left someone like me with, uh, it wasn't an option for me to not try and buy that. You know, it wasn't an option. I was, I was looking at it thinking, well, why am I the only one who's been looking at this for a start? And then when you then start to unpack that, start to reveal all the meaning, you know, what the artist is trying to do, the commission, the picture, what does this relate to, why are they not dressed in this particular way, all the things that you can explore. It's, it's like that Antiques Roadshow, the why we watch Antiques Roadshow. Do we watch it? I used to watch it. Um, but, you know, when someone brings out something and they go, oh, it's just been in my attic, you know, I don't know what it is. And, and then somebody parts value to it. And if you get excited, there's a rush, isn't there? Because you suddenly you see meaning from it. Mm. Um, and, and I think in the same way, you've been, there's certain objects, and we're going to come on to one actually on the last slide, we're going to go back four or five, um, <coughs> where I think, which is particularly valuable in, in that sense. But let's talk about meaning, because one of the key pictures, and I'll just flip the slide now, um, we had the exhibition was this painting. Now, this painting's for most people at, at Hope, it's quite easily recognisable as the 10th Guru of the Sikhs from Gobi Singh. Uh, I'm going to stop there because at the exhibition we had this up and this painting is replete with meaning as I understood it from you at the exhibition. So perhaps just in, in something very fine like this, you could perhaps just tell us a little bit about what you see in here and how we can perhaps interpret it, interpret a picture like this in your collection. Sure, sure. Okay, well, the first thing to, to appreciate and understand is how Indian art differs to Western art. You know, what, what are Indian miniature paintings? What was the motive behind painting them in a particular way? Um, and, then, and then beginning to view that from that perspective. So often, whether it's paintings or whether it's a sword or a helmet or whatever, is to think about when it was produced, who made it, why did they make it, and how, how is it being used? You know, it kind of... Um, you know, my eyes are trained to look at Western art. So, you know, I'm looking for realism, I want to see a photograph of somebody. You know, I'm looking for, I'm not necessarily 
I'm used to you know, sort of portraits and models as opposed to something like this. And you, you look at this and you think, okay, first of all, it's, it's quite small in size. Um, it's, um, paintings like this would have been portable. This is a portrait of a Gorgon's in the 10th of the room of Sikhs. It's from Pratyala, um, you know, Sikh state, not under Maharaja and Jit Singh's rule. This is sort of cis uh, southern state. And it dates to the early part of the 19th century. And we know that Gorgon Singh dies in 1708. So it's uh, about 100 to 120 years until this picture, this painting was painted. There are only portraits of it. So um, a, a ruler has uh, probably Maharaja has commissioned this. Uh, we know a little. We can kind of speculate because the artist here almost has to flatter the Maharaja in a way because he, he, he the Gorgon Singh looks quite similar to some of the Maharaja in his own portraits. Right? Um, the the method of painting the artist is. Uh, Gouache, um, kind of opaque watercolors, crushed gemstones and minerals that produce these really vibrant colors that were combined with gum Arabic and adhere to the surface. The image is polished, bright, heightened with real gold, real silver. Um, there weren't lights like this back in the day. This wasn't framed behind glass. We would have sat around and handed these around, and we might have looked at them under the candlelight. And the candlelight, you see that the gold and the silver starts to flicker and shimmer, and then you start to see depth and movement in the picture. So it's wonderful even to be able to view it mm. as it was a view back then, helps you to understand what the picture is. The Gorgon thing here, um, he, he doesn't necessarily come across as a, as a, as a saintly figure or as a guru, uh, but he's been doing a number of things. The Gorgon thing um, was this example of a complete man or a complete person, a complete human for the city. He, here is a noble, we see that he's wearing um, a sapphire or jewels in his turban, he has a string of pearls around his neck, his dagger is with jewel, his, um, he has all these different emblems of royalty, the royal parasol, they should be, if you find a royal parasol or an, or an umbrella in a, in a mongol sword blade, it means that it's from the imperial arsenal. He's a holy man, he has this nimbus or halo around his head, he has this divine protection, this um, winged goddess in the sky that showers her grace, you know, um, protecting him for his humble mission. Um, it almost looks like a cherub in, in, like in Western art, doesn't it? Being the winged goddess up there. Yes, yeah. yeah. And you see, like, you see, you know, Garuda and various other um, uh, winged figures in, um, uh, in Indian art. And this is, this, this is a, something that symbol, symbol that you'll find, not just in Sikh religion, but you'll find in what we would now term as Hindu subject matter, Hindu paintings, yeah, but they weren't necessarily labelled and considered that way then. I think it's really important to understand because we need to kind of now suddenly label and compartmentalise things in order to be able to compare them. But actually, back then it was far more mixed and inclusive. Who was the artist here? So this is fascinating because so so we we hear Bruce Robinson here. He's not just a ruler, he's not just a holy man. He's also a warrior. He has this. Uh, Pyro, of course, he has a Nahum warrior attendant, uh, and where Nahum comes from means like a crocodile uh, attendant who's his bodyguard, his hunting dog in the foreground, his horse has red legs to show that it's a battle hardened uh, horse, and, and then we see him with all the other accoutrements of, of war with the bow and the quiver and so on. Now, this painting, not many Indian artists leave us their names when they paint these pictures. We're not even, you know, they don't often sign the painting, the finished paintings, and the painting might have been one of the few that were produced from, from an original, um, an original sketch. Um, if we flick to the next slide, miraculously, that paint, this is the preparatory sketch for that painting. And these were, this would be both the sketch and the painting were found three years apart in separate locations. And it's unheard of. You, you, you do not find a preparatory sketch for a finished painting. These are not meant to survive. It's probably far earlier than the painting. It would have been handed down from one generation to the next. And here, we actually have a lot more detail. In many ways, it's far more fascinating than the finished painting because it's, it's fluid, it's quick. You, have, you can feel the artist's presence more. You know, and he, he annotates the, the sketch in their library, not in good looking script, but in their library script with the colours that he's going to use in different areas. And great for us, great for us is that he actually signed it. So we now know the artist, the artist is an artist called Ramajan. And um, it's just brilliant to be able to 
I'll be able to kind of find this with that because it adds so much more information. Um, um, so the, the writing here, are you saying he's, he's putting colours? Is, he, is yeah. that what he's saying? He's kind of notating that. Yeah, he notates colours, and, and I can't put that. We have to translate. I can't read uh, in my short study, but he makes uh, a note to himself that in the halo he says use extra strong gold. Okay. You know, so he brings it to life. Um, so sorry, I've got the original question. No, uh, it was really about the artist, and it brings me up to a question about art in, in the Sikh world, but perhaps in the Indian world as well, is that the artist doesn't seem to be, I mean, we know Ram Chand is here, but I, uh, from my knowledge, it's not, that's kind of a rare instance where we know the name of the artist. And often the artists are, aren't these figures like, I don't know, like a Michelangelo, you know, we know the artist so well. Yeah. Whereas in Indian art, Sikh art, we know the object, but rather the artist is obscure, not yeah, known. It's I think, I think it's a, there's a parallel here that runs through other Indian traditions. Like, uh, I was just watching um, um, on the BBC, uh, you know, Rhythms of India, um, <laughs> Indian classical music, and, 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 and there's something in there that I saw that actually made me think about Indian art. It's talking about how like, there's this hierarchy system in Indian classical music where you know, the, the, the vocalist is, is the most important person, and then you have the instrumentalist, and, Eventually, you know, at the bottom of the, you have the percussionist who actually plays the animal skins and actually is considered a little bit um, sort of beneath everybody else. And it's quite interesting because obviously we know double O maestros that you would consider an artist, yeah. someone who's extremely accomplished and no different to an instrumentalist or a vocalist in terms of their application and what they've done. Similarly here, uh, but the emphasis isn't given to the artist. What you might, what you do sometimes find is that there's emphasis to certain artists in the Indian, Indian main tradition where they're attached to a royal court, and you know they've, they've, they've signed works or they've left self-portraits, but not often. Um, it's more about the patron, um, and and no, it's not even about the patron so much. But it's more about the subject matter, and also I think that's connected to devotion, the devotional aspect of um, particularly with image like this of the of the Sikh guru. It's about it's about the subject more so than it is about um, the artist who actually painting um, painting the portrait. That's really interesting. So it's about the subject, but also very much about the patron, because you said the patron's face probably is part of the guru's face in that picture as well. Yeah, you see, so, you see, you see, the artist is clearly kind of flattering the patron, uh, and that will give us some clues. And we know that you know um, that there was a lot of art being sort of uh, patronising for the other, the uh, not just not just paintings, but you know, manuscript tradition developed there, and, and musical tradition was developing. So you see these, um, these parallels. So, so we, we let's touch upon patronage as well, because you talked about a couple of Maharajas, which people may or may not be familiar with. Maharaja Ranjit Singh, the, the famous Sikh uh, uh, emperor of, of Maharaja of Punjab, and and in the southern states uh, where this was produced, uh, there's the Maharajas of Patiala as well. So is this art a product of these extremely influential, uh, wealthy families? It, and does it stop when they stop? Um, so, um, that's a good question. It's, you find art existing on different levels. So in terms of, just like you find today, you know, there was um, the quality, the, the value that's on certain types of art. Like so you might find Art as being produced in the royal court, equally you might find art as being sold in the bazaars. You find art as being you know, made for a royal patron, or you find art as being made for a tourist market post 1850, for example. So you find art existing on very different levels. What we find with Sikh art, let's say particularly the Lahore court, Maharaja and Jeet Singh, is that in the main, the fine art that we see is being produced over a period of time when uh, the Sikhs are in power, Ranjit Singh's in power, and have to be given to those schools of painting, for example, and it flourishes in that time. Give us the time period, what is that? So it's about, it's about sort of, I would say about 50, 60, 50, 60 years, we're probably looking from about 1790 to 1840, 1850 ish, and then Pajamas Annex in 1849. So the actual period, you know, when you think about Sikh art being scarce, you know, Sikh art is, is excessively scarce, particularly out in the open market, because for two reasons. One is that it's not produced over a very long period of time. Compare that to, to Mughal art, for example, that's produced, being produced you know, over a period of three to four hundred years, and then developing over that time as 
well. C carp, uh, with regards to common law, is, is, we're only looking at a period of about 50 years. Um, also, after that, you find that the, when the Punjab is annexed, much of um, treasury um, is, is sold off, and then it builds up museum collections here, or goes to the royal collection, and then there is very much that's left out in the other so That's about 18, 1849, like the early 1850s. When, when the British take over, I think the art still exists, but in a different form. Yeah, right? and they change. So, so, you know, we're not going to an artist. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, it does come to being uh, commissioned to do something. So yeah. what you find is this transition where in the early part of the sort of 19th century, you have uh, particularly Lahore in kind of the Bahari Hills and the hills where these famous painting schools in Gunga and Bulir existed, and that pre-Sikh kingdom. Luckily for us, we find that when the Sikhs take power, that they, they carry on those traditions. Partly because they're interested, partly because they want to leave their own legacy, um, but also because they've been familiar with those traditions and they start to emulate the rulers that ruled before them. So whether it was the Mughals or the Bahari kings that were uh, patronising those artists, and the Sikhs said they were actually winning the same thing. And luckily they do that, and that's why those patrons did. So it kind of gives me status as well, yeah. as if I'm, you know, if I'm employing artists, creating yeah. art. It it's, about, it's about being cultured. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, like I said, it's not just in the, in the, in the military painting tradition, but in other traditions as well. Let's flick on to the next slide, because I think yeah. I, oh, um, it was probably what I wanted to talk about. But let's talk about what, and we'll go into what this picture is, but, and it's a, I think it's a question you've been posed before, but you know, what is this thing called sea carbs? You know, um, and I, I wanted to show this picture as, as an example, because and you can talk about it. This isn't a Sikh. It's been painted by a, a Western artist. Um, perhaps you could tell us who. Um, it's got nothing to do with Sikhs. Uh, in a sense that it, it's not produced by Sikhs, it's not produced for Sikhs, but yet you've got it in your collection as Sikh art. Mm. So perhaps touch on that and then explain, explain the context of what this is as yeah, well. Yeah. Well, it, everything goes back to that, telling that story, kind of constructing that narrative. So, the task of the book was to look at the objects that I've kind of found over the years and, and, and think, well, how do, I, how do I tell the story of the sort of rise and fall of the Sikhs through objects, through artifacts, take somebody on a guided tour, it's so much more fun to learn about something from a physical object. How do we do that? And what, what do we need to be able to tell that story? We, you know, it's, a, it's a broader Sikh or Punjabi, I wouldn't even say Sikh necessarily, it's, it's a Punjabi story, you know, Punjabi, Punjab not being a man, in its own right, you know, and, um, and it's about bringing all the different elements that help construct that, that narrative. And, and with this image, this is a, a, a portrait of Alexander Gardner, and as many of you may have seen him on the front cover of a book called The Tartan Turban. And he was essentially a, a, a mercenary, you know, he was born in Wisconsin, he travelled through uh, you know, Irish, American, Scottish ancestry, he travelled through uh, Europe, um, worked for the Tsar in Russia, went through Central Asia, and finally finds himself in the 1830s uh, in Lahore and before Maharaja Ranjit Singh, you know, Maharaja Ranjit Singh dies a few years later, and, uh, and Ranjit Singh employs him as colonel of the artillery. And, you know, Ranjit Singh had, he had rules for the European officers who he really valued and uh, had within his court. He had up to, you know, 100 Europeans at his, at his court. And, and he had rules for them, they had to, they had to keep uh, uh, their beards, they, they couldn't eat beef or smoke in public, and they had to, or one of the most notable they had to marry locally and say he didn't want them to disappear. And Gardner did that. You know, he, he stayed, he survived the Anglo Sikh Wars, his memoirs are uh, you know, a vital account for us of the Anglo Sikh War period and what happened you know, after Ranjit Singh's death, and he dies in Kashmir in the 19th century. And this is the only surviving portrait that we know of him. There are about three, I think, three photographs, three or four photographs of him. And, and we, we immediately recognize him because of his task and turn. And you know, by this time, we know that he was employed by the uh, Kashmiri uh, Dogras. His beard is fashioned in more of a Rajput style. The Kashmiri Dogras in their ancestry uh, in, in Rajput. And, um, and it was uh, uh, painted by, oh, sorry, it's sketched by um, uh, um, George Lancier, who is a famous Victorian artist. He was a nephew of Edwin Lancier, a favourite artist. We did the, the lions at Trafalgar Square, right? 
So he went he went and visited and he met a gardener and um, and did this uh, wonderful portrait. And the other thing I've heard he, when I did briefly he, he talk about it at the exhibition that you're an optometrist, aren't you, by trade? Yeah, that's right. Um, you had a, a good observation about this. Uh, so tell us about that. Yeah, so the, the very first thing that I noticed that was that he had a left eye squint. <laughs> so, um, so you can see his, his slightly wandering uh, left eye. And that immediately, when my, when my half my brain is kind of like artistic, the other one is a bit scientific. And immediately I thought, okay, that means that he probably had impaired depth perception. And then I started worried because I thought, hang on a second, the deep thing made him kernel of the artillery. <laughs> so nobody knows where the cannonballs are landing. And, uh, they, they, I actually read an account. Um, I can't remember who wrote it. He said he wasn't very good. I mean, he wasn't. Well, he can't. He, 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 he had a sort of instruction. Yeah. Manual, manual, yeah. Manual, did it's something. in the book, actually. It's in the title. That's right. right. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, that was the first thing that I noticed. So, it was, oh, he's got a wandering left eye. Interestingly, the, the, the seller, the seller said to me that he was being forced to sell it because his partner didn't like how he looked at her from the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's, let's talk about that because I think this is the fascinating part of this, um, um, and it, it's, it's about the collecting and it's about getting the inquiring. And I'm just wondering out here in the audience: is anybody collected? Does anybody do a collection ducks? <laughs> well, lots of people collect, right? I do I, 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 I kids who collect cards or something like that. Right? Is it just me? People collect. Right? You do? Yeah. We have, so, we have set up a very big a Sikh museum in Delhi. Right. Where we commissioned many artwork. Uh -huh. And two million people, we got tremendous response. Uh -huh. about two, over two million people visited in three years. And so we have walked way to a. Uh, that's like that. That's so a it's not only paintings, it's paintings, art slides, uh -huh. murals. We did it, uh, yeah. So that, that's kind of a, a great example of institutional collecting. As individuals, I think it's, it's kind of enabling us to collect or to make sense of objects and things. Uh, uh, I certainly have that in my life. Um, but but you, you do that, Vinda, and it leads you down all kinds of paths, doesn't it? And I know you're tight with the auction houses, you know the Sotheby's and now. Just tell us where you got this from. I found this on eBay. <laughs> Eat this. 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 So we, we're talking about it with raised awareness around it. We and with that, you know, you you pull a story from it and it gives it life. And with that life, it gives it value. It's valuable to us now because of something. Right? Because when the collector, and I, I met him because he comes to the exhibition. He's a lovely guy from Yorkshire, isn't he? Yeah, that's right. And he didn't quite know what it was. So he knew. He knew exactly. Did, did he know? Yeah, he knew okay. exactly. And that's one, one one reason why I found that. You know, occasionally I might have searched. Like an oriental man in turban or something, and then you know, something comes up. But um, there's one of my search words found it. But what was, what's interesting and fascinating about it, and we look at it, and how, how, how did it come up on eBay? But if I can tell you that I'm taking a story about most things that I find and where they turn up. Now, if we don't, now that we've discussed this, we've reduced the chance of this losing its value or importance over the next few generations. If we don't, it will just be sold as oriental man in turban. <laughs> Or you know someone with a tartan scarf or something, and and that happened. And you see, so sometimes you know, I might have found something and realised through kind of researching that object, actually it sold for more money 20 years ago. And then you think, how is that possible? And it's possible because it just takes a generation for that information to not be passed down, for something to lose its value, for something to disappear, to get hidden behind a bookcase, whatever it is, and. You know, one folder that they turn up in all sorts of places. Sorry, can I say one more? You can. Of course. The other thing that I noticed about this picture was um, what about he was left-handed? How we can't even see his hand. How would we know that he was left-handed? 
We have a camera for sure, but we speculate that he would most likely be left handed because his turban finishes here. And you would ordinarily, you know, if I looked at the turban in this room, I could probably guess if you're right handed or left handed. And most, you know, in fact, most, I suppose most left handed turban ties would be forced to tie their turbans right handed. But you can see that his turban finishes left arm up, so he would have been finishing it with his left hand. <laughs> Uh, let me move on from. I don't want to say that's a, that, that's a very important picture, um, but in the terms of the way you acquired it, it was relatively unknown, and you know, um, and it's, it's valuable in terms of the story it tells. This thing um, is slightly more obvious to what it is. Uh, it was well known. I think hugely. Uh, valuable in monetary sense and also historically as well. Um, and it, we displayed it, we managed to get it into the SOS gallery for our, our exhibition. And it's a stunning piece of the size of this stage, definitely between those two pillars here. Uh, and just a beautiful object, but a, a killing machine. Um, but tell us, I mean, that, that is something you had to acquire through more formal channels. It definitely did come up through eBay. <laughs> Use your network to acquire that, right? So, how, how does that work? How do you get something like that? Because for the ordinary Joe, like me, we don't see these things and we don't know how, where they exist. So, before we get into the piece itself, like, how do you actually, how does a collector like you come into the presence of these things and actually try and then make that uh, acquisition? Yeah. Um, you know, we've all, we've all got different specialist areas, we've all got areas that we work in and um, uh, are familiar with and you know exactly the whole idea of like 10,000 hours, you know, basically 10,000 hours in a particular subject matter and you might... The glad world. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm, I'm, I'm no, by, by no means an expert but I've, I might have spent more hours than the average person in this particular area and that exposes you to certain people, certain circles. Um, and then if you're a collector, you know, you get... Um, you get you get none. You know, people. You know, there are people that are making a business out of finding artifacts and selling artifacts. So, I, I, in the particularly in the early part of my kind of collecting career, I wanted to almost become synonymous with seek collector. So, if anything seek came up, now I wanted somebody to think, oh, let me go to Denver and call. And so, how do you go about getting yourself known? And the only way that you can really do that when you're collecting is by paying on time. <laughs> really, <laughs> right? You know, yeah, yeah. If you, um, that I always did, but, um, but generally speaking, that's what will get you, you know, if somebody wants to find so credit, you. Credibility. Yeah, you, you credit. need to have that. And, and um, so, and I'm kind of, you know, I'm immersed in this world. And then, um, so I had, I was approached by some, in fact, I was aware of this when, when I was about 12 or 13 years old. Uh, just, just kind of fleetingly, to kind of discuss, and somebody mentioned that it was, uh, it belonged to a collector from Stratford upon Avon, and he had come from Lord Guff's house, who was the commander in chief of the British forces at the time, the Anglo Sikh Wars, in Dublin, and it was acquired by this collector in Stratford upon Avon, and he was looking for a buyer for this. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's called a howitzer. It was a high, it was a tornado jet of its time. It's a, it's a mobile um, gun that is manoeuvrable, you can change the elevation, and it was the height of technology. Used by the Sikhs. Used by the Sikhs. Against uh, the British. Against the British. Right. Uh, it was captured in the last of the battles uh, in the Anglo-Sikh Wars, back to Gujarat. And, and it was, you know, when you're 12 and 13, you don't think much about this. Do you know, when you're 12 and 13, you're quite poor as well, aren't you? <laughs> uh, you, know, you shake your finger back, and there's not much in there. And I suspect when you started, you were quite poor. I, I, I kind of know, you know you're, slough, I you're a slough boy, I, 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 you know, you, just like us, you know, you're a very normal family, um, and this, I, I, I dread to think what, what it costs, but, I mean, did you, did you, is it the back of the garden, you just dug up some gold, or something? <laughs> did your mum swept some of the jewellery, how, it's a question, the, the, the reason why I ask you this, is, it's a question that I'm asked, you know, if someone sees you, and they go, what? Money. A lot of collectors, the profile of a lot of collectors, I think, is they make their money somewhere, mm. 
and they kind of it's only retirement they go you know we're gonna we're gonna get into this art um, so um, that that's you know you but you haven't you've gone through a different way haven't you? yeah um, so so I, I I'm really glad the way that I've kind of went through actually because the um, the the way that I started collecting the sixty pounds and that was borrowed sixty pounds. Uh, when I was 18 or 19 years old, and uh, I collected by buying a little rubber guy and trading a little bit, and, and then later on uh, I uh, worked and I saved and I made some good investments and I borrowed a bit more and paid back and borrowed a bit more and I'm missing that. Uh, but the, but the, I wouldn't do it any other way because through that process I had thousands upon thousands of objects kind of pass through my hands, and that was where the real learning was happening. Um, so, I mean, we've got a simple well, that time, I'll say that this turned up, you know, I was contacted by somebody who said, look, this is here, what do you think? Um, there was a bit of a for me, and eventually, you know, it was quiet because it was the only um, uh, private, private, um, going in private hands, you know, was in the, in the um, world there. Amazing. I, I'm just going to give you the notes, we've only got five minutes, we have an hour. Don't we finish at 10 to you? Okay. All right. Okay, so I'm going to give you less questions than I hope, so I'll probably 15 more minutes. Uh, so let me open it up to questions, if anybody has some, otherwise I can talk for another time. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. Mm, do talk. You know, you showed one uh, painting of Guru Gobind Singh. Uh, I got you a lot of trouble showing something like that at a Bhakadat TV program. It was on Sikhs and all, and um, I wanted to show, I think my father had said, show this painting, uh, because there was this talk about Sikhs trimming their beards. Now here was a picture which was shown, um, and I created almost a riot amongst the Sikhs who were in the audience, who were you know, somewhat fundamentalist. And they got very upset that I was showing a picture of Guru Gobind Singh with a trimmed beard. Now, have you ever thought about that? That some of these paintings which were done have shown Guru Gobind Singh was a man who, you know, had the whole Indian identity, Sikh identity of full beard and turban and long hair, showing a Sikh Guru Gobind Singh depicted with a trim. Yeah, I, I think I think looking at this and comparing it to other miniatures, um, I would say that rather than I don't, it's very neatly painted. Is how I would describe it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really look at that image and think that immediately my thought isn't that this is a trim bit. Because if you look at other images in that style of painting yeah. of people that you knew who had unshorn hair, they painted it in a similar fashion. So I don't think from paintings like that we can start to extract information, particularly a painting that's done 120 years after his death, that we can start to extract information as to how he looked like. But even if you look at earlier portraits that are more contemporary, the style of the painting makes it look like, like it's, it's just neatly done. Um, it, it's, it's not a style of painting, and the painting isn't necessarily about showing us his likeness. The painting is about showing us what kind of character he was, what he was embodying in his Sikhs, um, what his mission was, um, what the relationship with other cultures was at the time. You know, there's all the other information in, from the Indian, the Indian miniature paintings are like a musical rather. It's about mood, it's about expression, it's about a story and a hidden narrative that you have to kind of deconstruct. It's not about a realistic portrait, uh, um, not from what I've seen. You know, in, in the very beginning of your book, I think it refers to that Maharaja Ranjit Singh thought he did our jobs and the art is there to do a lot of contribution uh, to the Sikh arts in Kamala, you mentioned. You know, the one thing I haven't seen mentioned anywhere is the fresco uh, painting which in Pakistan had survived. I had the honor of visiting Baba Kim Singh Mehal in color. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's beautiful painting, you know, Hindu deities and, you know, Bhagats and all that. And the beauty of that is all the colors are plant-based color. They are actually, and that, that coloring still survives. 
I think we need to do something about it to preserve that. I mean, Baba came saying, uh, you know, the fort, a killa is called, is, is in, in a some state, yeah. but those paintings still survive. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in various gurdwaras as well around, around <coughs> Potwar and Texla area. Mm -hmm. I think if you have an interest in it, there is a case to be made Absolutely. to preserve that, actually not plaster with you know, the marble, no. that, which I think we're doing a mistake there. I think it's a legacy. I think it's a reflection of Baba Kheem Singh's work, actually. After Ranjit Singh died, Baba Kheem Singh was only two, three years old. So he actually revived Sikhism, in, 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 if at all, in Punjab. And he's got a lot of contribution to it. And he, he tapped into the Hindu reservoir, where all of this convert came from. Yeah, yeah. And I think we really need to, I mean, I know the convention has got a museum there. And a lot of people are doing a lot of work. I think what we really need is to pool our resources together and see this art survives. I think uh, uh, it, to back on you is that the whole question of built artist heritage is a complex, difficult minefield because yeah, it's, it's a, a different time. country. Yeah, yeah. About, yeah. Oh, I agree. Yeah. 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 Any more? That, uh, my yeah, I'm very okay, let me just uh, thank Devinda. thanks so much. But I've, it's a long time I've talked to you for a long time. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm very sorry to end this. And I'm one of the things that really came across though in this fascinating talk was just that way in which, you know, we, we talking earlier, we mentioned this, you know, the academic requirements, and this was just about not trying to impress us with knowledge, but bringing stuff to life and making us really absorbed in it. I thought that was absolutely fascinating talk. Thank you so much. I'm sure you're all going to try and grab the elusive character before he disappears to ask more questions, and maybe one day we'll see, see culture and a hundred objects in a book. Let's hope so. It'll be a lovely, lovely addition to the scene. Thank you so much, Brave. We'd like to see you break and we'd like to be back here for 20 years.